Hello, world. Welcome to another, another week of Golf Subpar. Colt Nost and Drew Stoltz. Sleaze, what a week we have in store. First off, we got to give a big shout out to Kevin Na on picking up his fifth PGA Tour victory down at the Sony Open. What an incredible performance. Yeah, four wins in his last 55 starts for a guy that's not one of the younger guys on the PGA Tour. I don't know if something's gotten drastically better in his game. We talked to his, his coach, Drew Stuckel, today on the radio, or if it's just a matter of like, hey, I got one. Now I start believing I can win a little bit more. But whatever he's doing, I think he's up to 23rd in the world right now. Uh, as long as he's got that putter, he can he can be dangerous anywhere. Yes, the man can absolutely roll it. But for me, Sleaze, I don't know if you can tell, my voice might sound just a little bit a little, little froggier than normal. Not the grass. You just, got that gravelly yeah. tone that all the singers strive for. I know. It really sucks, but you know what? Didn't suck. My weekend, I spent the week up at Shadow Creek. It's played three days there for our good buddy Joe Scovern's 40th birthday. And I'm playing a little hurt today, but it's always good to be with you. That's what you do. Play through the pain. If you're ever going to record a solo album, I think now would be the time. You got that, yep. that gravel, like I said. But as I've said on this show many a time, many a times, my favorite place on the planet. Got to spend... Three days there this week, playing with our guy Monty Montgomery. All the boys out at Shadow just had an absolute blast. The weather was perfect. I didn't want to leave, but my liver and my and my my brain really told me I had to get out of there. Yeah, I don't know how you do these like three day excursions to Vegas. I'm more one night, send it all the way, fly home early, but don't go to bed, come home, everybody's happy. You got a chance of coming out of there with some money. You go three days. I don't have a really good track record of winning any cash, but the the three night trip to Vegas, that's um that takes some heart. You're gutting it out today, dude, and I respect that. Well, I'll tell you what. You. I mean, when you go up to Shadow and, and you play with Monty and the boys and they just dump off money to you, it's hard to leave. It's more like a business trip yeah, than it exactly. is anything with a side of some entertainment in the evening times. Yeah, you go up there, guys are offering to play you. You got to go. got to go. I'm like, I can't, I can't afford not to stay. Of course, dude. That's, business decision. Uh, you were up there playing. I don't know if you caught this. This was this is the highlight of the week, dude. Uh, Friday afternoon during the coverage of the Sony, all of a sudden my phone started blowing up, started getting some notifications, Twitter, Instagram, this type of thing. So just recently, we had our boy, Harry Higgs, on. We got to spend a day with him, play some golf, come in here, had a great show with him. And we coined the term Big Beautiful for him, right? Mm -hmm. That was the nickname. That was the one we're running with. Well, on Friday of the coverage, Justin Leonard, I think, made it official. Use it on coverage, talking about Harry Higgs, what a lovable guy he is, all this stuff. And he says, and I'm hearing him referred to as Big Beautiful now. And so I started getting all these texts and stuff. So the nickname is, I believe it's officially official. So we've the, the snowball should begin from now. That makes me very, very happy mm -hmm. because he is the one and only big, beautiful, but Justin Leonard from now on, you better give Colton Drew Golf Subpar Podcast. Maybe some sort out. of a royalty from now on too. Exactly. We'll discuss that. But we got some very, very good news for y'all. Before we get to our guest, coming up after the interview, our gambling picks are going to be back. We decided to tweak it a little bit this year. And if you want to maybe give us your opinion, if you don't like what we're going to do, let us know. Send us a little message on Instagram, Twitter, whatever you want to do. But this year, we're going to do a survivor one and done pool. So once you pick a guy, you can't use him the rest of the year. We're going to add up all the money at the end of the year. That's going to be the winner. We're going to cut it off at the BMW Championship, which is the week before the Tour Championship, because the money there gets a little bit out of hand, obviously, and the strokes are a little different. But one and done. So you got to be very strategic here, Sleaze. Got to save your big dogs for the big events, WGCs, the players, the majors, obviously. So you got to be very strategic. Do your homework. One and done. Easy thing to keep tabs up. Very. Easy thing to yeah, calculate at the end of the year. There'll be no more running into any weird stuff during the Fed. And then we'll do a separate thing for the FedEx Cup. We'll fi figure out some sort of little micro gambling thing, too. Uh, also, I need to be paid on the caddy round. You do need to throw on the bib. Loop it for the kid one time. I'll keep it clean for you. Not a lot of balls in the des, but that needs fast money, fast, fast pay, fast friends. Well, you're no, you're so busy nowadays. I mean, you hardly play golf anymore. It's true. It's a good point. I'll make an exception for you though. If you get out there reading some but greens for the we kid. are, we are also going to give y'all like some favorites and some dark horses, so y'all can make some money out there and uh, really get amongst it. But right now, we got to get to our interview. Our guy Steve Elkington. We did it. We did it over Zoom, which. Obviously, we like being in studio with our guys a little better, but Steve Elkington did not disappoint. No, man. One of the better... We've been lucky lately between Harry and Kami and some of these guys. Really good storytellers, and Elk is a guy that's got them going way back. So we dug into a few of those, too. And just a guy that, I mean, knows as much about the game of golf yes. as pretty much anyone out there and very opinionated, too, which is always good to have. He's not afraid to, you know, rock the boat a little bit no, if he, he needs to. He just lets it fly. He goes. But let's get to it. Here's Steve Elkington on Golf Subpar. All right, our next guest is one of the silkiest swingers of the golf club to ever play the game. He is a two-time Players' Champion, a major champion at the 1995 PGA Championship. And not only that, he is the artist who created the beautiful faces on our golf subpar logo. Steve Elkington is in the house. How you doing there, Sleaze? Mate, you had a big day yesterday. I know Colt's sitting back there, too. Yeah, man. 
coming off the, the win, the shot heard round the world, walk off double eagle for my boy Andres the Gonzalez. I mean, never would you hear about it in the hit. You know more golf than anybody on here. You ever heard of a walk off double eagle in your life? You know what? Um, I got to tell you this story because it just just hit me. When I played the Champions Tour, I I was lucky enough to play with this young girl up in uh, at the Pebble Beach tournament. You know the equivalent, the Nature Nature Valley, and we were off the back nine at Pebble Beach on the last round. We had a great round, finished on the ninth hole. We were told that we think we've won the tournament, so we went all the way back to the 18th hole. John Cook was leading the tournament. We were in the grandstands behind 18 waiting uh, for Cook to finish, and we thought we had won the tournament. Well, one of the young junior players uh, that was playing in Cook's group hooked his drive into the water on 18, hit a rock, bounced back out into the fairway. We didn't see this, of course. But then we saw a ball land on the green and go into the hole. We thought, that's the coolest eagle I've ever seen. Then someone said, no, that's some guy that's made a double eagle. and That was to beat us. And my girl in the Nature Valley Senior Tour events, the only double eagle ever in the history of Pebble Beach on the last hole to win a tournament. Wow. Oh, that my is, God. I just thought of that. I should have thought of that last night, Sleaze, but that, that happened to us. And I, I spent the next two hours with the young girl telling her, it was okay, it's okay, we finished second. <laughs> oh, wait a <laughs> That's little. unreal. Wow. Yeah, off the rocks, too. Dre's was a perfect oh, shot, no. though. We'll move that one above. That's incredible. Well, El, yeah, you're right. El, thank you so much for joining us. I know this is going to be a lot of fun. And we kind of want to go back to some of your younger, younger days to start out. You grew up in Australia, obviously, but you ended up coming over to the United States and attending the University of Houston, where your team was just an absolute joke. You won three national titles. First off, I want to know, the only year you didn't win was 1983. What the hell happened in 1983? 1983 was in San Joaquin Valley in Fresno, and – um, Oklahoma State, Ver Plank, um, Tommy Moore, Tracy Phillips, may have even been Bob Tway hanging around at the end there. They were good too. Uh, they were in a playoff, I think, with Texas, and we finished third, I think, that year. But Billy Ray must have played bad because certainly. <laughs> I but you mentioned Billy Ray Brown. Who else was on that that team while you were at school? Because I mean, three out of four years—that's incredible. Yeah, eighty-two team, Billy Ray. Brown won the freshman. He and I were the only two freshmen that came in that year. We came in with two other freshmen on the basketball team, Clyde Drexler and Akeem Olajuwon, lived two two rooms down from us. Wow. And year, years later, we used to let them come down to our room. We'd let them try our rings on because they couldn't get one, you know, but we <laughs> put the rings on. And then three more doors down was Kyle Lewis, who was eight-time Olympic gold medal champion at the time. So it was pretty interesting around our dorm. Uh, even though we had the most rings, we were we were the by far the not the best athletes. But um, well, Billy Tootin was the Pub Links champion. Dave Tennis was on that team. Um, different teams. Mark Fuller was our captain. He was a really good uh, good player. Uh, Carlos Espinosa, you should know him, Colt. Do you? Mark Penderes was on one of those teams. Uh, Trey Tynett. Billy Ray and I were um, obviously on every one of those teams, but there was just a nice combination of guys coming in and out where i don't know i mean looking back it's pretty freaky so we did win three um but we obviously we were pretty stout that's incredible yeah we're on a team like that elk that's so stacked and you're winning three out of four does the, does your focus almost come when you show up to a tournament like be the low guy beat the other guys on my team if i'm the low guy on my team the chances are i'm gonna win the tournament or finish pretty damn high well oklahoma state were our big competition so they had uh, Willie Wood, Tommy Moore, Scott Verplank, Andy Diller. They were all short guys, and we were all we were all six two, you know. So we used to call them midgets and talk shit to them. You know, we'd tell them how short they were, and we used to wear Houston across our back like a soccer team, and we used to have the number of what number we were playing. So we were the only team that had had the name across the back of our thing, and it used to all freak them out when we come out there. You know, imagine golf back in the 80s with a, with a guy that says Houston across the back. So we'd wear them on Sundays. But, um, you know, growing up, I, I'm from a town called Wagga Wagga, which uh, when people ask me where Wagga Wagga is, I always tell them that it's only six miles from Gumley Gumley. And, uh, 
you know, Wagga, Wagga is an Aboriginal term, which means the river forks on one side of the town and Wagga means it reforks on the other side of the town. So small town, 30, 40,000 people, one, one golf course out, out of town, one in, in town, but super little golf course, no driving range. Um, just right after school, went and played golf every day. And I'm so thankful. Um, I was having a conversations with a bunch of people about the U S open was here at champions recently. And we we're talking about track man and what would you have done if you had track man? And, you know, and it was very interesting talking about all that, but I'm really thankful that I finished up just playing golf every day. Yeah. I mean, you had an incredible career, but you were known for how amazing and how beautiful your golf swing was. Was that was something that just you were, you were born with, was it natural God given talent or is that something you developed over time? You know, I don't, I don't think, um, I used to look at other swings, you know, I used to be like, uh, my eye would go to different swings and I'm sure yours did too. You know, I used to think Paul Azinger had a good swing with a, with a strong grip. And I used to think, uh, you know, Cal Pete, uh, different things. So I think for me, I had a good rhythm. I have really long arms. If I had dress, dress sleeves, I mean, you couldn't wear my shirt, Colt. My, I have 39, I have 39 inch uh, in sleeve. So my swings, you know, smooth, but I got long arms, but I think the positions of my swing were good and the rhythm of it was good. Kind of like Payne Stewart. So I think that's why people were attracted to looking at my swing. Although I always was working on it, but I always, I always knew what the rhythm was of it. I, I always knew how to smooth it out. In other words, I never worried too much about the positions of my swing. I worry more about how it felt like to me with the rhythm of it. Well, Elk, yours is one of the swings that people would bring up in terms of like prettiest golf swings that they've ever seen. Who, in your opinion, if you can't name yourself, who's a guy that when you watched him swing, you liked it, you liked that, that action more than anything? Out of, the, out of the older era, I used to look at Weisskopf because he was the same height as me. Bruce Devlin was same. He was from my part of Australia. I used to watch that. My favorite player was Jack Nicholas, but you know, the modern players now, um, you know, there's a bunch of them, but I like Justin Thomas's swing because he's, you know, for years, uh, I'm not referring to Colt here, but for years we on tour, we were trying to get the left arm a little bit lower, but now, you know, Justin Thomas is back up here, up high with a lot of width in his swing. I like that. I like Morikara, Schauffele. I mean, there's some guys that, you know, put the club in the slot on both sides of it. And, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just happy to see the, the swing plane sort of, the swing plane uh, groupies have gone away. It's gone back to where it's all about the computer and it's about driving the ball far. I mean, nobody's looking at Bryson DeJambeau's plane. They're not looking at Justin Thomas's plane. They're not looking at Tiger Woods's plane. You know, they're, it's, it's different talk now. Yeah, there's no doubt about that, but I want to stick in your era a little bit, because I think your era much different than nowadays. There was a lot more personality back then. There was a lot of characters out there. Who were some of the guys you enjoyed sitting around with having a beer, or maybe during a rain delay, you always went and sat with them um, to share stories with. I was lucky. Uh, I was talking on my show this morning uh, about the Hawaiian open. And I remember going to the Hawaiian open uh, in 1987 and I was walking, you know, to the golf course because I was staying just down the street. And the wind was blowing 30, 35 miles an hour. And I was thinking, I, I'm just not going to be able to play this golf course. It's just blowing so hard. And I look at the scoreboard right there. The ninth green, as you know, is right there next to the clubhouse. And Bobby Clampett and Tom Watson were coming through the turn. It was blowing 40. Uh, and they were both six under through eight holes. And I thought, what am I doing? What am I doing out here? I can't play out here. This is ridiculous. You know, and I remember seeing Ray Floyd there with all these handmade clothes with extra stitching down the side. Cal Pete was there. Lanny Watkins was there. You know, they all had all the gear and they had all this charisma and style, you know, and it was just, it was just a different era, you know, and not that it's not, there's good players around now. It's just different, but um, you know, answer your question, you know, it was always going to sit not in amongst those guys somewhere near Tom Watson or Lanny Watkins or uh, Tom Weisskopf, Lee Trevino was always good value. You know, all, any of those old school guys would, uh, was great fun to listen to. 
Yeah, and, and staying on that same topic, why do you think, like, when I look back to your era, you got you guys like you, I mean, John Daly, Payne Stewart, you go back further, Trevino, these guys with big, bubbly personalities, and we're always guys that people gravitated towards. Is it tougher now for the, the modern-day player to be more like that, being that there is social media and, like, uh, the media uh, cancel culture and all the things that are going on? I think some guys are just scared to be the way they are off the golf course? It's, it's, it's certainly possible. I mean... Justin Thomas had an issue this weekend. You know, they want they want microphones on the players, and then and then he says something which was he apologized for. Now they're going to probably have microphones off all the players. I mean, it's just you know it's back and forth. And um, you know, uh, Harris English. I was texting with his caddy last night, uh, Eric Larson, and uh, I was wishing that. that Harris English smiled more because he's such a such a good player, and I think I only saw one smile yesterday, and that was in the playoff when he made that eight footer to win the win. But now I, you know, I think there's plenty of personalities. Colt, what do you think? I mean, you just don't see it on the course anymore. Yeah, I think guys are kind of scared to show it a little bit, just because like what uh, Drew was saying. I mean, you say one wrong thing, you get criticized and ridiculed from all angles, and it's kind of tough. I mean, that's one thing I've always, and one of my questions for you was these made for TV events, you know, we see the tiger and Phil the match, and then we throw in Tom Brady and Peyton Manning. And yeah, they're, they're okay to watch, but like the, the tiger and Phil match was made out to be this huge thing. You know, we're playing for $9 million. We're playing at shadow Creek. We're going to have tiger and Phil mic'd up. And then neither of them said anything. I mean, it was arguably the worst golf broadcast you could, you could have. And I just think that there's so much for these guys to lose. And my question to you was, do you think any of these made for TV events will ever live up to the hype nowadays? I don't know. You know, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, the, the Tiger Phil match, we knew they weren't going to say that much. They needed someone like you guys, you know, commentating for them, but we knew it was going to extra holes and Tiger, since when has Phil Mickelson ever given Tiger a, a, a four footer or was, since when has Tiger ever missed a three footer? And I got all these guys in the bar sitting on thousand dollar bets and they're giving putts from five feet. I mean, it was the biggest sham that ever was. I mean, who didn't know it was going under the lights on the, on the, on the par three. I mean, the lights were already set up. Yep. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I get surprised sometimes um, what what people will watch and what, what the appetite is for golf. I mean, the match with uh, Phil and Barkley and all those guys, Steph Curry, I didn't really like it. It wasn't that good. The golf, the quality wasn't that good. It's all sort of a little bit made up for it. But, you know, it's amazing what people will watch. Yeah, it's a tough – it's a pressure for those guys, too, and they're like – they're not entertainers, quote-unquote. You know what I mean? They're golfers, and all of a sudden we mic them up and be like, hey, be funny and entertain entertaining for four hours it's like dude that's not what they're built to do they're built to hit good golf shots not you know be johnny carson it's a tough ask for those guys i feel like yeah i mean phil you know phil's phil mickelson you know for years was the hardest guy to play against you know he was tough and now he's kind of you know he's mellowed a lot since since he's gotten older i don't know if it's his kids colt you know i don't know but he's mellowed a lot since what he what he used to be do you agree <laughs> Yeah, I feel like even t kind of Tiger has too. I mean, they've kind of started to take the younger kids, you know, under their wing a little bit. You know, Tiger obviously knows he's at the end of this, his career. And, you know, it's it was always all golf all the time. And now he's got a family. And we've actually kind of seen a different side of Tiger, I feel like. We've seen a little bit of his personality. Like his relationship with Tiger Woods, I mean, with uh, with Justin Thomas is, is awesome. And that's something we never got to see in the past. Kind of the same thing for Phil. I mean, Phil loves getting the young kids out on a Tuesday and going and playing a money game with them. Yeah, I mean, I, I love seeing Charlie Woods. I mean, I was with Tiger like two years ago with my son, Sam, at the Players' Championship. And Sam even got to hit a couple putts with the with the red dot putter, the Tiger's putter, you know, and was freaked out because that was Tiger. Sam watched Tiger since he was a, a basically a little kid. And I said, do your kids play? And he said, no, my kids play soccer. That was Tiger saying that about Charlie. And then two years later, obviously the golf bug has got Charlie and he's in there. But, you know, it's nice that... Um, uh, Justin Thomas's father is working with Charlie. So now Tiger has to open up a little bit because now he's got to work with the Thomas family with his son, you know, just like I had to do with coaches, with kids and football or basketball, or whatever. Um, you know, Tiger never was like that. But once you get, once you get daughters and his daughter, Sam, who I did see in the ropes uh, at the, at the father's son, once you get daughters old enough to tell their fathers the way they should act, Fathers change their stuff pretty quick. I can promise you. 
Because the daughter will go, Dad, you're an asshole. And if you don't ever say anything like that in front of me again, I'm going to disown you. That's what daughters say to you. <laughs> sons don't worry. Sons don't worry about it. Get ready, Slays. It's going to happen to you. It's already happening, bud. She's softened me up. I'm losing my edge, just like Tiger, that I used to have that was well, so intimidating. I got a little 19 month old, man. Oh, uh, hey, I got one as a 25 year old. It's a high school teacher. So if you, if she goes, she tells 105 kids what to do every day, and then she comes home and tells the parents what to do every day, too. <laughs> That's it. It's that ain't, it, seven. it ain't never going to change. Elk, I got, you're one of the best storytellers, I think ever in, in the golf world. I've listened to so many of your interviews. I got to ask you to tell the stories since we we're talking about personalities. John Daly was a name that came up. Uh, you guys were close buddies. We got to hear the story about the time. I think y'all were playing in the million dollar event in South Africa and ran up against, uh, I think we we're at the bar grabbing some drinks and ran up against some boys that wanted to, uh, to throw some weight around. Yeah. Well, that was, um, I'm glad you didn't uh, prepare me for the show today. So they, they just, if, if I get prepared, I can't tell. I kind of choke. If if it's if it's if I'm not prepared, it's better. But we were in Sun City playing that million dollar, and it was my birthday. I think it was my birthday that day, Saturday night before the Sunday round, and they had this huge party that we we all went to, and it was just like a, a rave party. The bandstand was in the middle. They brought all of us players up. There's only ten of us in the tournament. Daily's there. Everybody's drinking heavy. Then we all go to the casino, uh, and it's probably midnight, and I'm going down to hit the tap the kidney, and I see John Daly coming down the stairs, and he sees me. He's wearing, you know, he's all Arkansas out. He's got his boots on. He's got his whole show, and we're standing there on the on the landing of going down to the restroom, and about four or five South African guys show up, and they go, "Hey, there's Elkington and Daly. I wonder if they know how to play rugby." And Daly's like, yeah, I'll try. I'll try it. And I said, JD, let's not, nah, nah, mate, come on, let's get out of here. <laughs> We're not going to play rugby with these guys. He goes, he, I guess I'm, or, I'm already out. And he said, so Daly goes down into a three point stance, you know, like he's playing for the, for the hogs up in, up in uh, Fayetteville. And he comes out of his stance after these three guys and they just absolutely poleaxed him into the wall behind it, knocked a couple of paintings down. Daly says, hang on, hang on, hang on. Elk, pull off my boots. He said, my, my feet were slipping. So he gets back in his three-point stance again. Mate, I thought they were going to – I thought he, he might have seriously had a concussion or something after the first time I broke his shoulder. That's how hard they hit him because these are big fellas. They, they don't care. Anyway, same deal later. Same deal. I hit him again, and I get John up. I sit him on the stairs, and I said, mate, you okay? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. So I didn't see him. I left, and then about two hours later, I was going to go home, I think, finally, and I went past the bar, and there's JD sitting there with just his socks on because he never got his boots back, and he's still he's still having a cocktail there at a, in the morning. So, you know, that was uh, that was a big night, JD. <laughs> we had some fun together. That guy. Uh, how how oh, good what how good was he? I mean, you, you were right in the middle of his era. He won the, obviously the PGA in 91 and the, and the British in 95. I mean, how naturally talented and gifted was this guy? When he won the, when he won the PGA um, at Crooked Stick, that was really the first time that we really kind of saw him, you know, for the four days. We'd seen him come on because, you know, he was a, he got his tour card, but he wasn't in every week, so we didn't see him all the time. And when he first got there at um, Crooked Stick, there was these bunkers at that course that were out there about 270. So we were all laying up to them or maybe getting in them or whatever. But then when he started winning that tournament, we all started watching. He was flying these bunkers for like 20 yards, 30 yards, flying at 290, 300 in the air back in whenever that was. And it was just, it was like something we'd never seen. And um, Squeaky was caddying for him, Nick Price's caddy. And it was just, we knew that that side of the game was going to be taken care of with squeaky caddy. And so we're like, this guy's going to win the tournament. It's going to be unbelievable because squeaky's going to get him around. He's not going to be able to blow up. He's not going to have, you know, he's going to be fine. And that was that. And then I remember the hype after that, when JD had that um, white Cobra driver that was made out of bulletproof material. You remember that? 
And we all wanted one because he was one of the few that had it. And when we got to Castle Pines where the air was thin and JD was hitting these, these bombs, I mean, it was like, we had never seen anything like it. And to go back to your question about how good was John, you know, he was one of these guys that just kept turning all the way. And he was able to keep his body without tilting back. And he could just stand there and just murder it from just standing flat footed. He could have shoes on or not shoes on. It was unreal to watch. And, um, you know, he could putt. He had a strong grip with his putter and he kind of had a drag stroke. So he had a lot of, he didn't have any hit in his stroke. And, you know, he, you know, people say he had a great hands, but he just kept going with his wedges and, and he would just, and, and, you know, he was just, uh, you know, I was glad to see John Daly and, you know, in all full flight because, you know, he had a lot of bad habits, smoked a lot of cigs, drank, you know, all this stuff. But part of that was the reason he was so good because he had such a don't give a shit on one side of his game, made the other side keep going, put the, he had the accelerator down all day, all day. Yeah, if he if he had stayed on, you said part of like you know his bad habits might have been part of the reason why he was so good, and he still had a great career, won two major championships. But let's just say he stayed on the straight and narrow and didn't have some of the things happen that did in his career. What do you think his ceiling was? Is he a four time major champion? Is he five, or what do you think that would have been? I don't know because he only ever only ever had two chances, right? I mean, I I don't think he had any other chances to win majors, but the two he did, he killed it, but. When he beat Constantina Rocker in '95 at the at the uh, was it '95? Yeah, '95. Uh, yeah, yeah. At uh, and Jack Nicholas was in the commentary box for the playoff, and they said, you know, John will probably lay it up on two. Nope, pulls out driver, smashes it down there almost to the green. Then they go over to 17. Well, he'll play up. He'll play left here. Nope, he's going over the over the over the hotel with the driver. And, you know, well, he'll lay up short of a uh, pot bunker. No, nope, he's not doing that. He's flying it in there. You know, he just he just had amazing keep the hammer down. I don't know what um, he would have done. I mean, when you think about how many majors you could have won, you know, would have won. The hardest part about the majors is getting getting into contention. You know, guys like John Daly or, you know, I always I've always said in my career, you know, Sean McKeel, who, you know, won that and, and people take away from Sean McKeel. He had to, he burdened a ton of pressure for two days there at the end of that tournament, then hit it like that at the last hole. I mean, to me, that's as, that's almost more impressive than a single Tiger Woods major win because he had less to work with to get it done under the same amount of pressure. So, you know, to me, it's like an Olympic medal. That's really cool. And Speaking of John Daly winning the British Open in, in 95, you finished sixth that year. 95 was an unbelievable year. You won the Bart Barton Trophy, which for people that don't know, lowest scoring average. You won the PGA. I think you finished you finished fifth at the Masters. So that was an just an incredible year. Fifth, sixth, first, and I believe you won the Mercedes as well. By the way, do you know how much money you made that year, 95? This is incredible. Maybe one mil. $1.2 million. You made less that year, finishing fifth, sixth, and first, and having two wins at major championships than uh, Harris English made in the Century Tournament of Champions. Isn't it crazy how the money's changed? Yeah. You know, I, I think about the money changing, but then I also think that Jack Nicholas won 78 times with 18 majors, and he won $5 million career total. So I'm thankful that I won $15 million instead of five. But that night in 90, in the 95 um, British Open, if you ever saw that tape again of the back nine, I should have won that tournament. I had all the looks, but I kind of choked. I, I kind of couldn't get it there with my putter. It was my first time to really feel like what it was like in the right in the top of the heat at the back nine of a major. And I was like, holy shit, this is a different deal. And um, I left that night. My daughter was just born my wife and I, we went and stayed at Glen Eagles. And I knew, I knew in my heart right then that night that I would never win a major because I didn't, I, I kind of choked and I'm like, I can't do it. I won't be able to do it. Can't do it. Too much pressure. Stop right there. Say that. But like what, how no, much, no, different, how much no, different no. is the pressure? Yeah. Compared. Yeah. It was, it was, I just like, I couldn't do it. I, I, I won't be able to do it. And 
to finish that off was I, I got a sinus infection that week. So I stayed at the British, I stayed at Glen Eagles for three weeks. And then the, my next tournament was the PGA. I flew straight to Riviera. Oh, so I was still playing good. All I had to do was take a little draw that I was working on at, um, at St. Andrews and turn it into a little fade. And I figured that out in the beginning of the week. And I was in the contention again on Sunday and it was the most, it was the luckiest break for me. Cause I was like, you know what? I just got over this other deal. I'm not doing that again. So I'm, I'm doing the John Daly. I'm keeping the hammer down all the way. And I was thankful because of what happened to me three weeks before is what the reason I won that one. That was the end of that story. Yeah. You put fun around 64 at Riviera. I mean, yeah. one of the greatest golf courses in the world, you ended up beating Colin Montgomery in a, in a playoff, but explain like why, how much different did you feel coming down the stretch of a regular PGA tour event versus a major championship? Oh, way different. Is it just cause it's a major and it's just, I think, I think the major, you know, a lot of people say, you know, you know, there's an old term, there's an old term. They say, you know, they can never take it away from it. Well, that's all. That's, that's not a good term. When you win a major, it's not that they can't take it away from you. It means you're never going to be forgotten ever in the history of the world. You'll never, you'll always be remembered for winning a major. I mean, people to this day for me, they might forget where I won or what major it was, but they don't, they, they know that that guy over there, he was, he won a major championship and that's, that's what carries it with you. So, man, I knew, I knew, well, the British open at St. Andrews was like, too much almost overwhelming. I wanted to win at St. Andrews since I went there in 1979, never won anything there, but I wanted to win there because it was so unreal. But as I just said, I had that opportunity in the very next event to win the PGA. And, you know, at any point I could have said, Whoa, I need to back off here a little bit. This is, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm ahead right now. I don't, maybe I just got to cruise here for a second, but I couldn't do it at the PGA, man. Something inside me was like, I should hit over there, but I'm not. I'm hitting. I'm I'm hitting right at it. Is that the nerves that you feel in a major, and how much it changed for you from your first one to you know when you won at Riviera? Is that is there any way to emulate that, or if you were talking to a, like a guy that's going to be in that situation going forward, or is simply the only way to to get used to that is by experiencing it and going through it? The only way is experience because you finish up with different different kinds of nerves, right? There's nerves of there's first tee nerves like every every person has a little bit, whether it's the tour or your club championship, you know, just anticipation, you're going to get started. Almost everyone that's going to watch this will know that if they get nervous when they tee off by this, by the time they get to the third hole, good, bad, or indifferent, the nerves are gone. You're in the game. And then there's different, there's other nerves. It might, you might get a little nervy when you're trying to make a cut and you're really, you know, you've a long way from home. And then there's nerves once you get in contention but it, a lot of it has to do with how you're playing. I would say to myself in a regular event, usually when I was going to win, I was playing really well. I mean, I wasn't fortunate enough to be able to play with a, you know, C, you know, win with a C game. So I would say to myself, Hey man, uh, who's playing better than me. I'd look around and you, you, you trick yourself into saying nobody I'm hitting it the straightest. I'm hitting it the, near the pin. Hey, Let's do it. So, but to emulate a major, major championship pressure, no way. Can't be done. Yeah, no doubt about that. Another place you had a ton of success at where I feel like the nerves are at probably the highest because the golf course can just make you panic is TPC Sawgrass and the Players' Championship. You know, you won there twice, 91 and 97. And you're a guy that I, I always thought TPC Sawgrass set up perfect for me. You know, it's a golf course. You got to hit the fairway. You can't really hit the And I called you the year before I played well there and we went over every single hole to it together. And I'm not going to spill out any secrets because I don't want anybody else to know because I'm currently tied for the course record there and I don't want anybody to break it. But what was it about that place that set up so well for you? Because that's the ultimate place I feel like you can choke. Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, um, you have to hit, I don't know. I think it's 11 shots across water. I mean, a lot of amateurs freak out when they got to hit one shot over water, but we got 11 and they got water on the other side and over and you got to make it stay pin high. I think, you know, my natural ball flight is a medium trajectory height with a decent amount of spin on it. So I could, I could drive those balls in there and get the ball pin high. And, you know, 
there's a reason, you know, that hardly any of the big strong hitters win at players because they either haven't mentally figured it out of how to make their ball get pin high or they just blow it off the tee all over the place. But as you know, I mean, you, you were, you weren't a long hitter. I mean, the course this week they're playing at uh, Wailai in Hawaii was a good course for you. Players champions, a good course for you because it, it's a medium range hitters course where the iron players is that's what it's all about over there this week, getting the irons on the green and making putts. But yeah, players championships, ridiculous. I mean, I, when I won there in 1991, I was just a young guy and I'm paired with Curtis Strange. You talk about tough pairings before Tiger or anyone was around. And by the way, Curtis was the first guy to wore the red shirt. He wore the red shirt when he won the, won the U S open, his first U S open at Oakland Hills. And then he won his second back to back U S open at Oak Hills in Rochester, wearing a red shirt. Well, in 1991, that was the year he won his second U S open. I'm paired with him in the players championship and he's wearing the red shirt. And that was pretty intimidating, but we got to 17 that day and I was tied with the lead. Uh, Phil Blackmar was up in there. Fuzzy Zeller and Azinger in the lead group, about three groups back. And we got to 17. And Colt, I don't know if you know this or not, but Bullet, my caddy, has the yardage book. Now they play the 17th hole at about 110. But that day was 146, okay, with a 25 mile an hour into off the left. Ugh. And Curtis was playing shitty. And he got, he birdied 16 and he had the honor and he's going for a 79. I'm shooting four under three. I'm, I'm three under for the day. I'm playing lights out. And, you know, Curtis had that sort of Jimmy Ballard sort of went soft on the backswing and he could just kind of rock into it. So I told Bullet, I said, just go over there and find out what he's hitting. That's all I, know. That's all I want to know. And uh, on 17, the wind's gusting, the flag's going down and coming back like this. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to hit 10 balls in the water. You know, if I hit one, <laughs> if one goes in, I'm going to fill the lake. But everyone's going to fill the lake. Curtis Strange takes a six iron and he hits a little chip six iron, no spin, and lands it right on the green. And I'm like, and, and Bullet comes back. I said, Bullet, what he hit? He goes, you don't want to know. And I said, what he hit? I said, I'm not telling you. Okay, what's the yardage? And he said, it's like 139 to the front. All right, give me that eight. So I hit the eight as hard as I could because I knew I knew he had, I knew Curtis hit more than more than eight. Didn't know it was six though. I thought it was seven. And I smoked an eight and hit it into the bank and rolled down, back down to the front left edge. And I three putted it. And on the very next hole, number 18, I hit it. It was dead into the wind. There was I think there was a 99 out of the top 100 players playing that day. And the reason I'm telling you that is the only guy that wasn't playing was Payne Stewart. And Payne Stewart was injured and he was on the mic. And I drove it up 18 and I got up there and Payne Stewart was standing by my ball and he's looking at it. And I'm like, what's he looking at? And I'm in a divot. I'm in a sand-filled divot. My ball's in it. And Payne Stewart, I could overhear him as I was coming up. I kind of veered off. He goes, oh, this is a really bad break. Elkinen's hit a super drive up here, but it's in a divot. This is going to be nasty as shit. This is terrible. This is a bad, this is, this is a horrible break. This is horrible. Anyway, I finish up hitting a, a miraculous three iron on the green and make the putt for birdie, which finished up winning the tournament from Fuzzy and uh, Azinger because Blackmar filled the lake up on 17 behind me. He was up there, but at any rate, that was a big deal because that, that carried a 10 year exemption. That was like, uh, that was like money in the bank. That's How about a huge... three iron out of a sand filled. Yeah. Pretty good. I, but I want you to go because you mentioned the 10 year exemption. I heard a really good story about when you won the 97 players on the first tee with Scott Hoke, y'all yeah. had an interesting interaction. Well, talking about nerves, I led the tournament from wire to wire. I led Thursday, everyone saying, good round, Elk, Friday. Hey, way to go. As you know, half the locker room's out. Saturday, I'm still going. I'm still going strong. I think I had a five-shot lead or something like that going. No, a four-shot lead going to Sunday. As you know, there's nobody around. By the time I get to the locker room, everyone's out there. There's nobody around. 
and NBC and everyone wanted to talk to me. My tea time was like 2.15, which is an excruciating time to tee off on a Sunday, you know. And I'd be sitting there and, you know, I said to Bullet, I said, I'm just going to swing in the room. I'm going to get to the course at 2.15 at the minimum. I'm teeing off at 2.30. Okay, pro, whatever, you're the boss. So I pull into the parking lot at 2.15. Here's all the cameras waiting to talk to me. And I said, hey, I'm sorry, man, I'm late. I'm late. I'm running late. <laughs> So I went and hit about five balls. I was already ready to go. I was ready to go at six in the morning, but I, I had to, you know, so I get to the first tee and I'm pretty nervous. You know, I'm trying to kill energy. I, you know, here I am five shots ahead. There's only one thing that can go wrong. You know, it's windy, you know, it's real windy. And Scott Hoke, I'm paired with Scott Hoke and he comes over to me and he goes, you know, if I win the tournament today, he goes, I'll be exempt all the way till I'm 50. And I'm thinking, what the hell? <laughs> He's 40 years old. He's, I, and I looked right at him. I said, well, this tournament had not got anything to do with you. I said, this is my tournament. Get the fuck away from me. And he snapped me out of whatever funk I was in because I went on and I blitzed it. I shot the low round of the day in the final group that day. You'd think normally there'd be a 60 something in the, but I shot 68 and I was pissed at him the whole day. And I, I should have sent him a Christmas card because that snapped me back into like, this guy thinks he's going to beat me. I can't believe it. This is bullshit. That's what I thought. I love that you That's snapped awesome. that like that on the first thought. Can you imagine that happening in today's world? Like. That would be like a huge story if, if if Tiger did that to Phil or Justin Thomas did that to Ricky Fowler or something like that. Oh, exactly. No, it's all changed, as, as you know. You know, they're playing now for points, you know. It's all about the points, and, and it seems like the money gets pushed aside. The money's great. I mean, what's wrong with talking about money? I mean, I don't, I like money. I don't understand. That's what we play for. Yeah, that's why they're all doing it. That's why they switching clubs and doing everything. It's all capitalism. There ain't, no, nothing, ain't nothing wrong with talking about it. One of the best things about our sport is I can grow up in Wagga. You can do your deal. Anyone can do it. Colt did his deal. Shit, I knew Colt when he first was coming along, when he was going to SMU. You don't have to have anyone tell you you're good to be on the golf tour. You can go and get your card and you can play. And you don't have to have a team. You don't have to have anything. You know, you're there. Boom. If you're good enough, you're in. And then they pay you by how you play. We're talking about uh, TBC Sawgrass and courses like that. And you mentioned uh, Wailai and, you know, Colonial, Harbortown. Those are some of the shorter courses that favor iron play. Do you wish there were, there seem to be very few of those on the PGA Tour anymore. Would you like to see a transition in having some more of those courses where it's not just all about hitting seeds out there as far as you can hit it and finding it? Uh, <clears throat> you know, they're in a big they're in a big battle right now of the distance, right? And then you see a guy who's one of the longest players on the whole tour, Justin Thomas, and he lays up yesterday on 13 and they made a big deal that he can't hit his driver straight enough to play the 13th hole. I think it was 13. What is that path for up yes. the hill? 14? 13. 13. 13 or 14, yeah. Short one he laid and, up. And the reason he did it is because he's such a good wedge player. I mean, they say bomb and gouge. I don't even know what that means. I mean, Justin Thomas is... A, you know, hits it long and he's a good wedge player. I mean, I'd hate to play against that guy, you know, as good as he plays, but, you know, um, to answer your question, um, Sleaze, uh, you know, Colonials, Westchesters, Wylea, courses, Players' Championship. The one great thing about our sport is it's not tennis. You don't stand and put your foot in a corner and bounce the ball three times and hit it to a guy who's standing in the same corner he steps in Indian Wells or it's all different Pebble Beach. So I'm all for different every week. That's what I'm for. Do you like the way the game's going right now with all this distance biased and everything like that? Or do you, do you miss the artistry of the game? Cause I know you were more of an artist. I had this, I, I had this conversation at the U S women's open uh, talking about track man. And people asked me if I, would I use track man today? And I said, well, of course I would. If I, if I knew that my swing was a degree or two off, uh, you know, and I could measure it and it would tell me that I could get it back real quick. Now, the difference about track man with the girls that I saw is they can't, they don't know how to change their swings. They have to then get a coach, Sean Foley or who was there have to come over and tell them how to move this, move the swing to get it to do what they want. But 
I don't think TrackMan is creating better players. It's it's telling them how fast they swing, but I, I think players lose their rhythm. I, I don't I don't. What was your question? I forgot your question, but I went somewhere down. To <laughs> the the, the, <laughs> do, you, do you like the way the game's going where it's all distance? And I mean, like, for example, Bryson DeChambeau at the Century Tournament of Champions was number one in strokes gained off the tee, but he was next to last in accuracy. So it basically yeah. shows you accuracy doesn't mean anything. Does that bother you at all? Oh, for sure. I mean, Jack Nicholas, you know, at the Memorial Tournament, he said on TV that, you know, I don't mind if Bryson hits it down there 350, but he's got to hit it into the same area as the guy that's hitting it 250. So there's got to be some, got to be some, you know, design features where you can't just go over everything. I think what Bryson's doing is good for him. I don't think, uh, you know, he, he proved it and he won the U.S. Open. But, you know, he's playing a different game as far as the math of it. He wants to get closer to the green. He wants to get more looks from 20 feet. He converts more than the average person from 20 feet. So he thinks getting closer to the green is better for him. Probably is. I mean, if I put a six iron shaft in my wedge, I could probably hit my six iron 160 yards, maybe 150. So he's got a whole complete set built around his deal. Is he the best player out there? No, he's not the best player out there yet. He's a Who is? Um, probably the best player out there from top to bottom would be Justin Thomas, probably. Interesting. Uh, when you put all the when you put it all together, I mean, Rory McIlroy is one of the, probably one of the most gifted. Dustin Johnson, gifted. Um, Rory's head is not always in there in the game as much as it was when he was younger. I think anyone would say that. Dustin Johnson, uh, I don't want to say he has an unorthodox action, but he does have a little bit of an unorthodox swing action. Um, but he is, you know, he's, he, he's made some huge uh, upgrades in his game. I mean, he didn't used to putt as good as he used to, and he, he's, he's got control of his wages. But I think when I think of a lifer, who's going to be on tour all the way through the seniors? I think it's Justin Thomas. He's he plays a um, real conventional swing action. There's no stress on any piece of his body to swing it. Putts better than you know he used to. He's improved a lot. He, he wedges. He's he's improving. That's what I see. So if you're making a bet and you could have one guy who wins the most majors the next five years, is it Justin Thomas for you? I think so. Over over the other two I just said, or or throw in Bryson too. Yeah, whoever you want. Yeah, Justin Thomas. Yeah. Hard, got his, dad, his dad's his coach. I mean, talk about a team. His team's pretty tight. Very, very tight. Yeah, he's got – he's one of those guys – I kind of think like John Rahm, they have zero weaknesses. I think Rahm's another guy that's just – he's an all, he's got the all-around game. Rahm, you know, I was interested to watch Rahm, you know, because I know how highly you guys talk about him and, and other people that I know at Silverleaf and all that. Pat Perez talks real high on Rahm. You know, I gotta, I gotta, I, I gotta believe the guys that see it. Rahm is gonna have to deal with uh, the shortness of uh, the speed of his swing under pressure. And I think he'll get it, but you know, a lot of people say he has a swing, short swing, and I say I like his swing because basically he he swings the club until he's as far away from the ball as he can. Now, if you think of John Daly, he's as far away, but then he comes back closer, 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 and then goes. he can do that. But Rahm is like a pulling a rubber band. He just goes to the further, far away from the ball he can, and then comes back to it. So he can do that. But I did notice he has a little drop in it and that's, that's hurt him in places in majors. And I think he'll fix that. Yeah, he's we we rave about him. We get the you know we get a chance to play a lot of golf. Them and just from a top to bottom, it's hard to find a hole in that game right now. I don't know how the short swing translates to you know his later years, but right now, man, when he gets going, it's uh it's a thing of, of beauty out there. I remember seeing Ron for the first time <clears throat> ever when he was playing at ASU, and I was at the waste management tournament, and the pin was back left on the 17th hole on a Friday, I think. And he drove it back there by the pin. And I'm like, who hit that? And some guy said, that chubby guy back there from ASU. And uh, 
and uh, it was Rom. <laughs> I'm like, nobody else can reach the green that day. It was into the wind or something, and Rom knocked it back there by the hole. He kind of reminds awesome. me of playing, like, I mean, I, I was lucky enough in Dallas to play golf with Trevino um, when I was a lot younger. And into the wind, I noticed when, when I play with John, like, his ball just doesn't get affected by the wind. Like, Lee was, as you can probably attest to, better, way better than I can, into the wind, Lee Trevino could hit it a lot further than he could downwind. Like, downwind, I would outdrive Lee by a long ways. But into the wind, he hit it so solid and hit it through the wind so well, he could hit it up there a lot closer with me. John Rahm into the wind just absolutely smashes it. Yeah. I've never played with Rahm, but like I said, I I, I want to. And, uh, you know, he, he looks like he's playing terrible and finishes fifth. You know, <laughs> yeah. Justin Thomas looked like he just chopped it all over the golf course at the Masters this year and what he finished, third or something. Those are the guys that leave the signatures that I see, you know, it's like they're not playing their best golf. I mean, Justin Thomas didn't play that good uh, last week, finished third, whatever. Yeah, missed you know? playoff by a shot. Yeah. 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 And I, I think both of those guys have that F you. I think that like the physical is one thing, and then you got to go to the mental. They both have that F you. They want to rip your head off and, and stomp on it, no matter what you're playing for, whatever the scenario. I think both of those guys have that aspect too, which I think is arguably when you get to that level, more important than maybe the physical. There's a pretty big separation right now. I don't know if you guys notice this or not. There seems to be a separation of about, about a dozen guys on the tour that are way better than everyone else. Cause I handicap golf now and, and I, you know, I just see a bunch of guys, you know, that are there every week that have got great stats, you know, and there's, and there's, there's a few wannabes coming along that are, that bounce up in there, but there's a really good handful of young guys like, Shawflay, Morikawa, English. I mean, there's a bunch of guys that look the same, that all look solid. Uh, Russell Henley, you know, Joaquin Neiman, they're all right there, but they they have separate, in my mind, they've separated themselves from the pack. No doubt. I think you guys agree. Uh, yeah. There's a, there's a very small group at the top right now that there's I think all is the top. And then there's about 12 guys that are right there too, you know, also. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a small group, like you mentioned, that you feel it, it looks like they play like shit and they finish fifth. There's a few guys, there's a handful of guys that can do that, and then there's the others. I mean, we hardly saw Xander Shaw play on TV at the Century Tournament of Champions and he finished fifth. Finished Every top. time. Yep. Well, I would I downplayed I downplayed Shaw because he was getting over COVID. And he's you know, in the practice round he said later he only worked five holes and he felt terrible because I had COVID, so I knew what that felt like. And I and I downplayed uh Rom because he had new sticks and I think you know under pressure even if you shot a 59 at Silverleaf with him which I heard he did you've got to look down at a friend under pressure so I I downplayed him so I'm a real hero for catch, catching those guys either one of them didn't win so that that's props to me Congratulations. <laughs> incredible incredible handicapping oh, but Thanks. we could talk golf with you all day there's no doubt about that but we got to get to our fun part of the program the emergency nine Nine fun questions to learn a lot about Steve Elkington. We ask this to everyone right out of the gate. There's a movie made about the life of Steve Elkington. You can pick any actor, dead or alive, to play you. Who's it going to be? I, I'm not good at this stuff. <laughs> dead or alive. Uh, Liam Nelson. Yeah. Oh, okay. He was in my runnings for you, Elk. He was Who'd in you the go runnings. With? I went with Clive Owen. I know he's an English guy. You're, you're an Aussie. I don't want any conflict there, but I think Clive Owen would have been. Uh, that would have been a conflict, Lee. Sorry. Yeah, I, I should have gone with somebody from a little I just, further south. I just went with an Aussie, and I went uh, Hugh Jackman. No, nah, too good looking. I, I, I totally agree with you. He's way too good looking for you. I'm going to have with an ugly makeup, guy. <laughs> yeah, with makeup, they can doctor it up, make him you know down to your level. He likes to fight, though, Elk. You like to fight. There's that. You know what I mean? He's an yeah, X-Man. Nelson, he, might, he could kill you with any hand. Hey. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Second one. And Gary McCord told me this, and I just want to know how it's accomplished and if it's true, but Gary McCord told me you can sign your autograph on a golf ball on a single dimple. That's true. Wow. How does one do that? Micro calligraphy. It's all in the wrist. You got to have the right pen though. I can take a, a micro pen and sign my whole name in, in a dimple. Yeah. Wow. Steve Elkington. Did you ever do that to like a fan and throw it to him? And they're like, oh, yeah. Hey, I once signed. Uh, I think Asshole didn't sign my ball. I think Tony DeBarro <laughs> has the President's Cup from like 96 where I signed both teams and both caddies on one, on about eight dimples. All teams, all caddies on, on eight dimples. Wow. Got it, I think. 
a cartoonist, micro calligraphy. You do it all, El. The handicapper, shit. Yeah. Pretty Busy much. man. Everything's happening here, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, number three. I heard you were, you're anti-hotels. You're, you're, you're not staying there. I know you, I think it's maybe an allergy thing, but can you please explain why? And you, I heard you recently sold it, which I'm very sad of, but can you please tell the people at home about the big show? I'm definitely anti-hotels. I think there's, um, I think there's a limit in your life. There's a, inside of you, there's a limit of how many hotels you can stay at. And then once you've gone to that limit, then you got to do something else. You know, I used to hate getting my food under plastic or I go in to get a drink and there'd be plastic on it. So I just, not a germaphobe. I just can't do it anymore. And the big show was a uh, mobile estate, double decker that Will Smith had when he did um, Men in Black. And I had it on the Champions Tour. It's pulled by an 18 wheeler. You can't ride in it, but once it's set up, double decker, you can look at it online. Uh, Potting Green, Bourbon Bar. Look. Oh, by the way, you, Yep. I think you might've slept on the floor there one night on that. No, I did not sleep rug. on the floor. This is not true. That sounds right. That's I've let's spent go time with that. Big show, but I've never slept there. Yeah, you're right. We drank a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle one night, me, you and Pat at- Well, me Pace. and Pat drank it. You didn't, you were pretty pissed off the next morning at us. <laughs> he goes, this lazy, you'd love it. We got a little banged up, uh, up, in, up at Pat's place, filming some stuff for Secret Golf. And we got Elk to open up a bottle of Pappy and me and Pat drank the entire thing. And I was the next morning, I was like, Elk, that was nice of you to open that bottle of Pappy. He goes, yeah, wish you assholes would have let me have some. Seemed like, yeah, it, seemed like a good a, idea at the time. <laughs> oh, That's man, a quick that way to lose a friend right there and drink the whole bottle of Pappy that they opened up for you. But it is, <laughs> it was cool, Sleaze. You should have seen it. Obviously, he said full bourbon bar, little entertainment area, putting green up top, had, could sleep how many people? Uh, there's a big bunkhouse. You could sleep a dozen. Then major bedroom Jesus. in the back for me. Yeah, it's it's the big show. Big Why show. Would, no wonder you're anti hotel. It. Shit, you travel you with the Ritz. No, no, you got you got yeah. rid of it. No, no, no. I just yeah, I just finished up. I didn't have anywhere to go. We shot a 48 episode series on secret golf, and uh, where I went around and played public courses and shot passion. Uh, no, it's just, it, it can be, it can be bought back. It's not okay. done, done. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. like that Fair enough. That place sounds incredible. I can't believe you drank all his pappy. That's, some, that's, that's a tough one to swallow. All right. Next one. Next. Yeah. I go, yeah. It happens. All right. Next one, Elk. I'm taking you back to the 1995 world match play. Okay. You got a 36 hole match against Colin Montgomery and you come off the morning 18 and something happens, and this is when you knew you had his ass dead to rights. Tell us what happened. <laughs> <laughs> this is so good, dude. <laughs> well, Colin Montgomery, you know, <clears throat> played golf here at Houston Baptist, so I know Monty better than anyone. But I beat him in the in the PGA Championship, and then that year later in the summer, I went over to play the World Match Play, and I I get him in the in the second or third in the third round. I think it was the semifinal, and you know. The press and everyone over there is Monty wants revenge, right? On Elkington. Okay, whatever, Monty. So every match at World Match Play is a 36-hole deal. So after 18 holes, I have like eight birdies, and I'm one up on this fat bastard. And <laughs> we go into the clubhouse, which is a castle, and there's a, an area just for the players to eat. Well, there's only like four people left in the tournament, but they have the most unbelievable buffet in the middle of the deal and the clubhouse at Wentworth is a is a castle and right in the middle of this buffet is a custard castle it's magnificent all the food and all that my wife and I are sitting over in this corner and Monty's over on the other side he's got Prince Andrew he's got you know Prince Higginbotham the third wank wank over there and he's got the, all the crew over there and so Monty gets up, we got to, we got to tee off back off in about an hour and he gets up and he goes over and he gets a dinner plate and he takes a big spoon and he goes over to the custard castle, the clubhouse. And this son of a bitch takes out the ladies locker room, the observatory, the pro shop <laughs> and part of the greenkeeper's shed onto a plate. I mean, he had this deal. And I thought to myself, what the fuck? 
there's no way he's going to take five forks over there. He's going to put it in the middle of the table. That's his, that's his deal on handling the Royal family. Nope. He went over there and sat down and ate all that custard himself. And I sat there and watched his fat ass eat that custard. I turned to my wife. I said, there's not a man alive that can eat that much custard that can beat me in this back nine. <laughs> <laughs> I beat his ass about four and three. I said, he was custard out. Oh, oh that is so awesome. good. I love that it's story. The ladies locker room. The, the, <laughs> the maintenance shed. Guest bedroom. Oh, that is awesome. Oh, shit. Well, you mentioned That's the good. bottle of Pappy that... Uh, <laughs> Pat and I consumed. You're a big bourbon guy. Give me Steve Elkington's top three bourbons. Price doesn't matter. Well, you know, if you're going to go day to day, you got to go with the number one bourbon from the taste test. It's like a Blanton's, a very tangerine taste. If you want a little spicier, you might go with something like a Maker's 46 or a Weller 12. Uh, Angel's Envy would be a drink that I think that everyone loves. I mean, bourbon is big, long palate of woodsy and peppery on one end and sweet and vanilla and all that but um you know i've got all the pappy van winkles they sit there there's other ones that are really good um but you know all right the ones as you know cool can get down there and help you out I'll help you get rid of that pappy if you need mm -hmm. i gotta send, send me a bill there. All right, Elk, this is the next one. If you need a little bit of a reference where this comes from, let me know, but I'm going to ask it like this. Can you please define the word rubber donga for us? <laughs> well, that story was, um, you know, when we started at implementing the drug policy on the tour and they were going to do drug testing and we were at a meeting in San Diego. Were you at that meeting, Cole? Probably. I don't listen when they talk about illegal drugs. Like, oh, I don't, I'm not on any performance enhancing things as you. Yeah, mean. this is when they were all talking about it, and um, I was I at the end of the meeting they were talking about they were going to do a urine test, blah blah blah, and I knew this thing called a wizenator, which is a wizenator is a fake penis that you wear over your penis full of someone else's urine, <laughs> and you you get you clean. Wear it, you, you wear it to work, and if yeah. you, I mean, don't don't. Don't laugh. I mean, they sold 800,000 of them last year on the internet. Maybe, maybe allegedly, I don't know that, but maybe McCord could fill you in on that. But so it's called a wizenator. So um, I think Fincham was up telling us that we're going to do this and we're going to do that and this and that. We're going to test you as soon as you walk off and this and that. And I said something about, uh, so let me, let me get this straight. With, with golfers, we're going to tee off at 6.30 in the morning at San Diego. We're going to get up. We're going to get a rubber penis and put it over our penis with someone else's clean urine. We're going to play with that for 18 holes. And then we're going to get out there and we're going to shoot that into a jar. And, that, and you want to see all that? And it's like a rubber donger over your deal. And he said, and Fincham, after the meeting, he came up to me. He said, you totally fucked up the whole meeting when you went down that track with that. <laughs> 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 uh, he, didn't, he didn't know that there was such a thing as a wizardator, but do you call nobody's wearing a wizardator on the tour do you think god no no, no. I think greg norman may have been wearing one in that instagram picture floating around <laughs> that could have been a rubber donga <laughs> yes it was something abnormal going on in that thing but didn't they want you to like the whole rule was are right, you got to take off your shirt and your like get all the way naked basically so you can show that you don't have a rubber yeah, donga a big tilted mirror tilted back at you so you, you know you had to go th this deal so the guys there you know doing this show yeah. you know? that's a bit aggressive i feel like it's like knock yourself out pal you know, <laughs> see it? You know. have at it making sure right. you don't have the rubber donga the rubber donga they need to rebrand that under that name that's incredible all right next question um you're known for wearing some very interesting outfits um, Pat Perez says you arguably have the worst fashion sense he's ever, ever seen. So in a few short, short words, could you please describe your fashion sense? I don't have any, uh, <laughs> I don't have any. And he's not a very good one. He's not a very good one to talk about that, but, uh, you know, when you go to New York city, you'll see a guy in a pinstripe suit with a paisley tie. There is no rules. Sleaze, help me out here, mate. You, you got a bit of style. There's no rule of what you wear with what you wear when it's a suit and tie. So I've taken that a fraction further, as you know, so there's no rule anywhere. So 
Yeah, dude. The man makes the clothes. The clothes don't make the man. If you got what it takes to pull it off, you can make anything look good. And you had a, maybe the best shoe lineup of all time out there. Bingo. Sleaze gets it, Colt. I was hey. sitting on the – me and Pat Perez were hitting balls on the range at the Canadian Open at Glen Abbey one year, and here comes Elk. It's a long walk from the locker room, and he strolls onto the range with, like, a lime green shirt, brown pants, black belt, those red and white style shoes you wore – in like a, some awkward colored hat, and you just look at us and go, I look good, boys, don't I? <laughs> we couldn't have been. It was the worst thing I've ever seen. It, obviously, you dress good to feel good. You feel good. You play good. You play good. You make money. You get money. You get laid. It's a circle. <laughs> it's a circle. circle. Okay, stay on that a second. That's have you the ever circle walked of out and your wife just go, no, you're going to change? Not one time. She she knew me when I was in college. I mean, we've been married 30 years. She's like, that's interesting, but okay, whatever. I'm stuck with you. Perfect. My daughter, hey, my daughter, she's a, a hippie child. She she makes me look like you. She makes me look uh, monochromatic compared to my daughter. We need to get that quote made into a shirt. It's just a big circle and it goes off. Look good or dress good, feel good, play good, make a lot of money, get laid. That's the circle of life right there. Get laid, feel good. Feel good again, and then you start yeah. back over again. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Brilliant. Yeah. All right, I'm in. That's hard to argue with. All right, here we go. Next one, Elk. You've been quoted as saying, you're a guy that likes drinking and you like fighting. All right, so we're going to combine both of those here. You're going into a bar fight. No telling how many guys you're going up against, but you get to pick one PGA Tour player, either former or current, to go into battle with you. Who are you taking? Current, I might take Kokrak. Mm. Yeah, he's country stout. strong. He's pretty stout. Um, former Colt, you could go low, couldn't you? You, you <laughs> could take <laughs> <a> high, <laughs> high. Use Colt as the decoy. Just throw him yeah. out there. I go sweet talk everyone and cheer him up. Tell him not to fight. This is a terrible no, idea. No, I don't like fighting. I don't like fighting. I like. I have a little social sip though with you, uh, but uh, you know. I'm 58. Can you believe it? How old's McCord, by the way? Is he over 70? 109. Yeah. <laughs> He's breaking the record every day that he keeps ticking. He's actually 71. Is he really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Active is all shit, too. All right. This is we used to do, talking about McCord, we used to do, when I first came on tour, I was a rookie. He was he was a comedian or he was a magic guy. We would do, we would do, he said, I got an outing for you. He said, We're gonna, you're going to hit balls. I'm going to do magic tricks. We get paid $100 a piece. You in? I'm, I'm, I'm in. I'm in. We're doing it in LA. We do it like three nights a week. That is awesome. He, still can, he can still do all those things. He's got some crazy tricks, and the hands are still still sharp, man. It's, he it's pretty cool to live in a railway see. car when I met him. Yeah. He lived in a storage unit for a while, too. So he's, he's defied the odds. Yeah. Man. Now he's got a penthouse. Things, things. Yeah, he's doing okay now. Yeah. All right. Last question. Elk, you were a member of the only international team to win the President's Cup in 1998. America has obviously dominated this event. Do you think the international team will win the President's Cup this decade? How many more is that for us? How many more, how many more is that? Well, got, the Ryder Cup this year. Get, so you got, just to say you got four. One, three, so they win one of the next five. five. Yeah, you get five. Who's the captain? Mark Immelman? Trevor, Trevor Immelman. Mark Immelman's not the captain. <laughs> he might be broadcasting it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, Gold jacket, green jacket. I think the greatest thing about us winning that tournament, forget that we won it. Peter Thompson was the captain five hmm. times. That was his name. He won five British Opens. He was the greatest guy in the world. Um, I don't know, Colt. I mean, if Tiger Woods is going to be the captain, I mean, what chance do we have? No, you guys are so loaded. I mean, we got to take, you know, we got to take, you know, I don't know what the tour says, but we're supposed to take a bunch of guys from all over the place. There's never known one another. It's going to be tough. Yeah, it's a, t it's a tough format. I wish it was a little, like last year, obviously, I think the golf course is what made it so close, being at Royal Melbourne. But, yeah, that, uh, was a, that was a good look. That was, I wish they could figure out something to make it a little, little more competitive. Yeah. Well, Elk, this get, get, get Elk in there as captain. Tell them the circle of life, dude. They'll all understand. What's circle of life? Yeah. Fuck. What let, else do they need? Let me, let me do the outfits and, and give, them the, give them the speech. We'll be ready to roll. There you go. Everyone wins. Well, Elk, as always, it's been a pleasure, my man. Thank you so much for joining us on Golf So Far. Thank you both. Uh, enjoy your show. I love it. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Elk. All right. And that was the 1995 PGA champion, Steve Elkton. And, Sleaze, how about this? I didn't bring it up because I don't even know if he remembers. The first PGA Tour player I ever met. With Big Elk? Yep. Where was it? So I, my, my good friend, Ross Rourke, him and Elkington are good buddies. So we made it to the state championship my freshman year in high school. I believe I was 14 years old. And my like, kind of reward for making the state championship was Ross took me down to Colonial. Um, this was on a Tuesday, practice Sunday. This, this is how much things have changed. We just stroll in. Hello, we're here with Mr. Elkington. He meets us at the front. We stroll into player, di- player family dining in the locker room, puts his shoes on. We have a bite to eat. I just walk onto the range with him, watch him hit balls, go out for a practice round, spent the whole day with him. It was an absolute blast. That's pretty sweet for a 14-year-old kid to do that. And just walking out onto a, onto a PGA Tour event, like, yeah, where's player dining? We want to go in there and hang out with our yeah. buddies for a little bit. Little, I can barely get my mom in there right now. now. Dude, he's got so many good stories. He's a regular on Jim Rome, uh, and he's gone on there and told some unbelievable stories. So some of those, if you've listened to that show, you might have heard before. But dude, the, the Colin Montgomery story <laughs> about the 36 old day and him coming in and they was this was billed as like Mon, you know Monty was gonna get his revenge on Elk and all this stuff and he goes in and there's a tight match and then he, he watched Elk he, the way he tells that story he's like I watched this man just load custard load custard he's like there's not a human on earth that can beat me after eating that much custard I think that's an unbelievable I love that I he love said that story the, the tower of custard was built like the clubhouse he's like he took the men's locker room the women's locker room the, the card room shed, the, yeah, the shed, whole everything. shit I was like oh my god. <laughs> Because yeah. there's no way his ass is going to beat me after eating all that custard. Yeah, how about Monty just in the middle of a deal? Like, oh, yeah, I might as well load up on a few pounds of custard to get me through the second 18. That's uh, 30, Walking 36 is tough anyways. You load up on that, it's damn near impossible. But Elk, he is one of my favorites to sit down and talk with. Like I said, he just lets it fly. He doesn't really care. If you don't like what he has to say, yeah. don't listen. And he gets in trouble occasionally. But, like, you know what? I, I, I like guys like that so much more than the toe-of-the-line guy. There's so many, so much of that out there right now because people are afraid of getting in trouble. And I don't blame them. You know what I mean? You say you slip up a little bit or say something that's unpopular, they're going to be coming for your ass. And But Elk Ben really seemed to give a shit about that. And no. that, that's why he's always always fun to have him on to talk about pretty much anything. Nope. I can't thank him enough for sitting down with us. It was, it was a lot of fun. And we'll, I'm sure we'll do it again sometime because he's got many, many more stories. But now... It's time to get to our gambling picks. We got the American Express Championship this week out in Palm Springs. A little change in the format. No amateurs this year because of all the stuff going on with the pandemic and everything. And we just got two courses. No La Quinta anymore. No La Quinta Country Club. We're just at the stadium course and the Nicholas Tournament course at PGA West. So it's going to be a really strong field. Just two days and a cut instead of three days like normal. But heck of a field. We're going to start with our survivor pool. This is where our personal bet, which we haven't set the stakes for this year yet. Yeah, we're we, – if we you're, you're going to chime in on Twitter or social media, whatever, it, throw us out some ideas for the stakes, too, because we don't know right now. Over oh, round of caddying, that was last year. We can ramp it up. We could do whatever. We're open for suggestions, but we're working on that right now, but we got to get the ball Yeah, rolling. this is going to be much easier to keep track of. Yeah, way. We won't have to worry about the Tour Championship then like we did this this past year. But I'll start it off, Sleaze, for my first one and done, okay? This man, his last three appearances, 2017, he finished second. 2018, he finished T-third. 2019, he finished tied for second. What are you trying to say? Well, last year, he didn't play because he was um, him and his wife, the birth of their child was that week. So he had to miss out on this week where he has not finished worse than third in the last three years. I actually played with this guy when he shot 59 at La Quinta Country Club. I know we're not playing there this year, but this guy loves this place. It's a great way for him to start off the year. The Canadian Adam Hadwin is my pick. Hard to hard to knock that one. That's an expensive baby, by the way. Oh, no any, any any other week of the year, you know what I mean? No. This is a week I normally make six hundred fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> you got to pay. You can go to whatever college you want, kid. You couldn't be born just, next week at Torrey Pines. Maybe just hold it, just pinch it, just <laughs> yeah. pinch it for a couple of weeks no. till I get back. But yeah, I mean, he's a, he's a great pick. You mentioned his track record. And he fits the bill. I, I'm kind of trying to go with a similar type of guy. And, and you and I both played these golf courses. I don't know if you'll agree with me here, but I, I feel like neither of the courses are very long by today's standard. I mean, the par 72s are like, what, maybe 7,200 yards, mm-hmm. if that, somewhere around there. And I think it, the stadium course, you got to put the ball on the fairway. There's some there's some drives that will pucker, pucker you up out there. But mostly, I feel like second shot golf course, iron play is is pivotal. And also, with the way the scoring is, 20 to 26 under, I think, is kind of what we're used to seeing win out there. You got to make, you don't shoot 22 under without holding some putts. So you got to have a guy that can, that yeah, can I mean, roll it's normally, it it's dome golf out there. Very Typically, rarely do you yeah. get any win. You normally, the weather's perfect. Why, that's why, one reason a lot of guys choose to start their year here. It's like, you just kind of dip into your toe it. into it's the shallow end golf. I mean, and just kind of ease your way into the season. Yeah, stadium course got a little tough, some tough holes out there, but it, there's, there's no rough. You're, like you said, dome golf. There's not a lot, but I'm going with a guy. I think that's in the same vein as Adam Hadwin. I'm going Russell Henley. Okay. I like him because uh, 11th last week, 
I like a guy that's coming off a week already, not maybe not starting their season at the American Express. And since the restart from COVID, uh, when they came back starting at Colonial last year, he's number one on the PGA Tour strokes gained approach. So that's the kind of the stat that I think will matter the most is iron play. Nobody's doing it better than Russell Henley last week. And he finished 11th last week with a bad putting week. And uh, he's the guy that I think that when he gets going with that thing, he can get really hot and he's not afraid to shoot some some digits out there. So I'm going to go Russell Henley for the one and done this week. Yeah, I like it. He uh, he was he was very high on my list last week for the Sony Open. Did all right for me. But uh, yeah, you're right. He's a guy that can go very, very low. As far as maybe our favorites or dark horses, so you guys out there can try to make some money if you want to, if you want to place a little wager. For me, I mean, it's no secret, I'm sticking with my dark horse, Adam Hadwin. He's 66 to 1. So it might surprise you a little bit. He's going with my one and done. But here's a guy. He, he hadn't, didn't have the best 2020, but I'm telling you, something about this place really gets him going. He's going to be my dark horse. As far as my favorite, a guy that's probably a, it's a big surprise that he hasn't won yet on the PGA Tour, even though he did just finish his rookie season. But he finished third here last year. He finished T13 over the Century Tournament of Champions, shooting 17 under par. My friends in Dallas have been saying this kid's been playing some great golf. There's no doubt in my mind he's going to win at some point this week. I just th- say, why not this week? The American Express Championship, Scotty Scheffler, 16 to 1. Yep, house favorite. I love getting a little inside scoop from the guys at home. We do it out here in Arizona. Whenever we see a guy starting to trend, we'll start to load up on him. So if the boys back in Dallas say he's playing well, he doesn't really play bad very often at all. So, uh, yeah, Scotty Scheffler as your favorite. What's he going? 16-1? 16. 16. to 1? All right, I'll start with my favorite because he's the same odds. 16-1. to 1. I'm going to go Patrick Reed here, okay? Uh, I'm picking him because, like I said, with this, how low the scores are out here, assuming that the, the wind doesn't blow, you got to have a guy that can hold some putts. Patrick Reed, incredible with the putter. Uh, greens are fairly easy to read out there. And in 2021, he hasn't played a ton of events. I mean, this is stretching all the way back to like the U.S. Open, but his worst finish is 21st. This is a tournament of champions out in Hawaii. So not a great week out there for him, but he's just a guy that uh, there's not a lot of mistakes and he gets a putter going. I think he absolutely have a week out there. So he's my guy at 16 to one and I'm going to go long shot here. 80 to one is my guy, Brendan Steele. So I'm, I'm picking him. This is the reason why coming off a ni- nice week last week, 54 hole leader, disappointed second year in a row that he hasn't been able to you know close the deal out there in hawaii but still playing very 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 well uh ended up finishing fourth place and he just does a lot of his damage on the west coast really good west coast we know what he does at safeway i mean he's a staple up there tends to always do well but i was i was torn between all right is he going to be disappointed showing up this week that he lost another chance and didn't get it done or is he going to be like you know what i'm still playing really good golf and i got a week out and he drives it so long it doesn't matter out there as much but he's a great driver of the golf ball when he gets going and in terms of guys who can win at 50, 50 to 1 or, or higher, I think Brendan Steele is a guy that, that could do that. There you go. 80 to 1. That can make you some nice money. If that's cheese. Brendan Steele is able to get it done. But that's going to be our picks for this week on the for the American Express Championship. Next week, another big interview com- coming. Half man, half amazing. You know him as Andres Gonzalez. We'll be in studio. We're back in studio. Dre is making another appearance in town. We're getting a lot of. We're getting a good fix of uh, Andres Gonzalez out here. A lot to get into. I mean, I think both of us. We go way, way back to college golf. I traveled the mini tours, Canada, all that stuff with him. There are some. There will be some really, really good stories coming out of this one. I, I just feel like you're really trying to stretch this twin fin thing out quite a bit. So you're making sure a guest that was there. Part of the winning team, so we have to talk about this twin fin for another. We got to get it while it's hot, dude. We can't talk about it two years from now. Eventually, we'll first... we might be able to let this story die. A little well, it's been the first thirty minutes. Or so. I'll let you talk to Dre about it. I'll just, I'll just tune out, and you guys can. Have I don't a little, want to. I've heard moment. enough about it. I, I feel like I was there. I've, I know every shot. Yeah, well, you should have been because it was history. Well, history was made, bud. Well, let me tell you, if I would have been there, this might not have happened. Mm, debatable. Just throwing we'll, that out we'll there. We'll see what Dre has to say about it. But it's going to be, a, I mean, dude, one of the most liked guys in professional golf. Nobody can say a bad thing about Dre. It's going to be a fun one. Yeah, you're not going to want to miss it. Andres Gonzalez in studio right here with the boys from Golf Subpar. Everyone have a great week. We'll be back next week.